and so it's three two one roll of Welcome back, everybody, to the Strategy Sprints podcast. What if you could hang out with sprinters and ask them about their problems, their workflows, and their solutions? Today, we discuss with the president of three Acton Academy schools in Northern Carolina, co-founder of Apogee Strong and host of the Essential 11, how to connect to younger generations in your community, why we should leverage interns, how having interns makes our recruiting robust and our business future-proof. Welcome, everybody. Matt Boudreau. Thank you, sir. It is an honor to be here with you. Yeah. (laughs) I'm excited because future-proofing our business, who doesn't want that? We want. And we use interns and we have very good um, experiences. So, yes, let's share this with the world. But first, Matt, what are you currently creating? So, as you mentioned, I am the president of three uh, Acton Academy schools right now. So if people aren't familiar with Acton Academy, they are. um, And yes, I'm biased, but I also don't think I'm wrong. They are the best K through 12 programs in the world. And we are a global network of K through 12 programs. um, And I'm creating as many as we can handle out here, as many as the market demands. Uh, So these are schools that are essentially run by the students. Uh, So we are creating these programs where these young people come out and they're just different humans because they've got an experience running a full on organization and and helping uh, their fellow students. So we are creating as many of those as we can handle out here. Uh, I've also got a global mentorship program with my friend Tim Kennedy. Uh, And so we are are mentoring young men right now. We're in uh, about 30 different countries with the young men that we are mentoring and then I get to talk about all that on my podcast as well. So never hurting for something to do. Life is good, my friend. That's beautiful. Yeah, tell us about your podcast. When did you start? How did you start? So I started the podcast a little over a year ago, um, and it was started because we had uh, I had done a focus group with fifteen hundred young people from around the world, and they were when I say young people uh, specifically it was ages thirteen to twenty two. And I went to them and I said, okay, look, if I'm going to some of the best entrepreneurs, professional athletes, actors, you know, comedians, whatever, if I'm going to some, some people that are making a dent in this world uh, and getting advice from them for you, what would you want to know? What would you want to ask these people? And so we kind of cultivated what we called, you know, the essential 11, right? The top 11 questions that we got from these young people. And we use that as the framework for the conversation. So very much like a Tim Ferriss uh, you know, tribe of mentors style. So I take those questions and we and we use those as the framework for having these conversations. So uh, over the course of this last, you know, I guess just over just over a year, we've done a little over 100 episodes with uh, some of the brightest minds on the planet and get their feedback for these young people. And it's been a blast. And the questions are, uh, how do I find a girlfriend and how can I start <laughs> finding Bitcoin on my phone? This, yeah, you know, you would think maybe those would be the questions that came up, but um, no, they're more around finding a mentor. They're around uh, developing self-confidence in the 21st century, developing self-awareness, uh, getting rid of anxiety. How do I move forward? Um, you know, one of the questions that we ask them is if, if I was a young person coming to you and wanting to find a job and I want to come work specifically for you, you as the hiring person, what are you looking for? Um, you know, there, there are things like that that young people really do uh, want to know outside of finding the girlfriend and, and all of that as well. So, yeah, and it's been um, it, it's been really cool to hear the answers because, again, we're talking to some high level, you know, high level CEOs and um, people that I'm sure a lot of your audience would know. And so it's fascinating to hear what their answers uh, end up being. So, yeah, it's been it's been fun. And I am a Montessori uh, scholar in in Rome in the 80s. I was in a Montessori school. So I am very much into the mindset that every scholar is the project manager, is not the object to be taught, but is the subject to teach and to learn and to collaborate. So everything that is entrepreneurial, I have been waiting for 20 years now to happen in schools. Can you tell us? What was the hardest part in in starting it? Is it getting adoption now? What's your experience? 
Wow, that's a really good question. Yeah, the the hardest part still is, so yes and yes. The is it getting adoption? Absolutely, it is. Especially during this, um, you know, during the pandemic, as people started, uh, you know, students were having to work from home, and parents really started to sort of pay attention to what was going on, and they were seeing what was happening, and um, you know, so that kind of was shining a light on what we are doing. So we've got more and more people that are moving over towards, um, you know quote unquote alternative, which we think is real education. It's not schooling, but they're moving towards this and saying, wait a second, this might make a lot of sense. Um, so that's been a good thing. But the hardest part still is that emotional attachment that so many people have to the traditional method of schooling, right? And I, I can always say I can walk the majority of people through an intellectual understanding of why what we're doing matters, why having the young person be the subject, as you said, right, versus the object, why having them be the project manager versus the project to be worked on. I can walk almost anybody through that from an intellectual standpoint and they'll go, yes, 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 yes. That absolutely makes sense. But their emotional attachment to that they have a really, really hard time breaking because they went through school. They were conditioned. They were trained. School looks a certain way. And so they still stay stuck in that mindset. I tell people, you know, school for so many, uh, especially here in the States, is a it's a religion. And they are very much tied to that religion. And if you go outside of that, there's a cognitive dissonance that kicks in and it really challenges them from an emotional standpoint. I have had, Simon, I've had parents sit down with me and literally say these words. I've had a parent that sat down with me recently who is a public school teacher but has her child here with us. She said, okay, first of all, I'm so grateful. My child is happy now. He, he was never happy in school. He is more self-aware. He's more confident He's 12 years old and he's making a thousand dollars a month in his business that he's running. He's so far ahead of where he was before, but I don't, he hasn't looked at a math book in a while. And that really concerns me. And I'm going, do you see the, the things that you are saying right now? You're talking about this amazing growth for your young man. He's running a PL, so he understands math right? He gets it, but you're worried that he hasn't opened up a math textbook. That's how strong the conditioning is. So that continues to be our largest battle. Oh, I love this. And I, I want to jump in in this. I think it's really about different religions or different belief systems. Yeah. One belief systems being knowledge is outside of our children. And mm -hmm. the other one is knowledge is inside of them. Mm -hmm. Already there. Yep. And they lack nothing. And if you see them, if you observe them, you see that they have exploratory power, un 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 unstoppable, and mm -hmm. they and they have big questions. Like my kids are three years old and they ask me mathematical questions. Of course, they don't ask in a textbook way, but sure. they are asking scientific questions all the time, more than we can handle actually. So we need to learn here. That's right. I love that you said that. I love that you said they lack nothing because that's absolutely correct, right? So that changes the entire strategy from an adult perspective. If they lack nothing, then our job isn't to just cram a bunch of garbage into them because we think they need it. Our job is to continue to unlock that curiosity. As you mentioned, you know, they're asking scientific questions. Science is about questioning. That's it. It's the scientific method. If you look at it, it's about questioning. It's about never ending questioning, continuous curiosity. That's what it is. It's not getting to this definite you know, conclusion on every single thing. And we always talk about the fact that uh, good questions are infinitely better than answers. And so it takes that adult perspective and then shifts to, okay, I've got this young being. My job is to just continue to peak curiosity. Sometimes it might be to motivate and to inspire, but then it's to do that and to get out of the way. Set the, you know, like a flower, you set the, you set the outside, you make sure there's sun, you make sure there's soil, but then you let the flower grow. And, and that's the exact same thing uh, that we do with our young heroes. So I love that you said it that way. Is, is, the, is this type of school that is self-managed 
the best school for every kind of personality of young people or should there be a clarification like this kind of personality will be overwhelmed and this kind is is a perfect fit yeah that's a really that's a really good question too because we we struggle um with that because i believe this is the inherent nature of the human right and so i think if you start so i will i will back up i guess i will say if there is if there are true special needs this may be more difficult right we we tell the parents up front if there really are special needs going on here um true special needs you know true disabilities present then and then i don't know if we always um are the right thing for that and again the more the more severe the special need the more i would say no this isn't the right place but i do think it is the default for humanity so what we say is if this young hero is young they've never been exposed to another system um we believe this is a default yes this works caveat is it's got to be perpetuated at home right so if we are speaking this growth mindset here on campus but then they go home and that parent believes they need a bunch of things crammed down the parent doesn't speak as you know in terms of a growth mindset the parent is psychologically beating this young person down well then ultimately we are going to lose so yes this is the default for young people but parents need to be on board and the younger they are the better because we've seen students come to us at 15 16 17 but they've been trained by that traditional school and then it is really really hard for them to get into that growth mindset so i would say default yes but there's all those little nuances right they go into the conversation when we start talking about families that come to us so um, it's an interesting thing but I, I think the default programming for for humanity at that default dna level yeah this is this is what learning looks like it's ingrained in us and in this same flow of thoughts you have a ceo tip for us that says hey if you run a business think in a specific way of future generations and involve them into the journey. I will ask you everything about that after one word from our sponsors. Love it. Hey, if you like the tools, go grab them for free at strategysprint.com slash tools. So how can we approach future generation and, and why should we do that? So there is a again kind of this default thought right that that young people are incapable and we are training them to be people somehow and we say no no they are people <laughs> they are people from day one and so they are very much capable of massive amounts of responsibility in fact they crave massive amounts of responsibility we just have to show them that we trust them with that. And just like you would trust your adult employees with the responsibility, we would do the same there. And a good leader is also understanding that mistakes are gonna be made, whether this is a young person or an older person, and we've gotta be okay with that as well, right? So taking it from a perspective of these young people being able to take on massive responsibility um, is really that, it's really that first step. Um, and when we're doing that, you unlock the uh, constant battle of, ooh, how do we find good people? And these arbitrary metrics that we've set up for our organizations of, oh, but they've got to have X amount of experience. They've got to have, you know, the, the this amount of these degrees and they've got to have, we pigeonhole ourselves and we start to say, oh, we just can't find good people because we're not creating good people, we're not going to young people who are also good people. So we open up so many windows uh, if we will do that and then allow for the young people to take on more and more responsibility. I always tell my CEOs that, that I help coach for Fortune 500s around the world is, look, we gotta go, go to the young people, give them more and more, scaffold the responsibility for them, let them make mistakes, but scaffold this responsibility for them and hire them with the very open, concept of you are here to take on responsibility you are here to grow your skills and if i can help you grow your skills even to the point where you are so desirable to everybody else that ultimately i end up losing you that is what i've got to do and kind of hiring to fire in that regard 
um, the, the paradox is a lot of times you end up alleviating your amount of turnover too. So I am very big on hiring young, hiring early, and the fact that you will keep them for, for the long haul if you really invest into them and their ability to produce. Absolutely. I second that. And if I can add even one, one experience, my mentors have always been 20, 30 years older than I am, mm -hmm. especially in the first 20 years of my own um, entrepreneurial journey. So always like, mm -hmm. okay, you have scaled businesses uh, in the past. Look at mine. What do you see that I don't see? And yeah. the last 10 years, I have been looking for people who are 10 years younger than I am, 20 years younger than I am. Because that conversation, what does really matter? What is, what am I not seeing? Mm -hmm. what, what do you see happening and where is it mm -hmm. going? I ask people who are 20 years younger than I yep. am. And I have to start a conversation by finding why why they would want to talk to me. Yeah, right, right. I and mean, I that's, love it. Yeah, and, and that's the way, that's, again, it's that default DNA of how we should be approaching people in general, but it is now in this world that is shifting every, every few years, things are shifting, things are changing. And the younger generation, especially now, is they're just, that's default for them. They're used to that, they're understanding that. So they have um, a, a psychological, ability not just to learn we all have that they've got a psychological ability to unlearn more so than a lot of the older generation which now is a skill that is equally as important because the system that you and i are speaking on right now when we're looking at each other face to face we're in different countries we're having this conversation and this is great this is amazing technology but in three four five years this technology right here is obsolete there's something else there, right? And for us, it might be like, oh my gosh, now I have to learn something new. Whereas these younger people go, no, this is just the shift that has taken place. They are willing to unlearn this. They are willing to unlearn you know, this iPhone. They are willing to unlearn those quickly to adopt the new things. And as businesses moving forward, we need to be able to adapt by unlearning those things as well, right? So that, that's another massive benefit. Absolutely. I am studying right now because I run masterminds, sales masterminds. Yep. And I see that the traditional way is broken. So what I'm studying right now is the esports and the gaming industry. And so I hang out in Discord groups because this yep. is the this is where it's going, just to understand which communication patterns make more sense. And so I know that these generations are just probing what will be in three years normal for in my field. So that's, that's right. why I hang out there and and I see that they are much smarter in terms of investing. These are games oriented platforms where they usually talk about gaming, but also right. the whole crypto world is on there. The, the, right. the pioneering crypto people, even the old guys like me, they yeah. are there discussing yeah. investment opportunities because yep. yeah, that's where stuff happens right now on the floor. That's forefront. where stuff happens. And so paying attention to that, right? We take it even from on at the campus level here at the schools that we are building, we gamify everything because we know that generation responds that way. That's what they're, that's what they're doing. That's where they're hanging out. That is where, that is kind of how their mindset is developing, right? So even from the academic standpoint, we gamify it. From a system standpoint on campus, we gamify it from the job descriptions I build out with each employee that I have, I gamify it. And we start everything with, what is the game that I am playing? What are the rules to this game? And how do I win this game? That's the framework for everything that we do. And once we can define those, then I trust the person to then go figure out how they are going to win the game. We've got the basic rules. It's just like, it's, you know, it's kind of like driving. Uh, you know, I, when I explain that to the young, younger crowd and, and kind of put it in that framework, they're like, cool, give me the rules to the game. I'm going to go win. Here we go. If I've got somebody, you know, maybe it's one of the parents that are like, wait, I don't understand. How does that, how does that work? The best thing I can say is like, okay, it's like driving. 
Um, your young hero is, is driving the car. Um, we are essentially just the GPS that says, okay, here's, here are the multiple different directions you could go. Uh, and, and then the rules of the game are the rules of the road, right? You can drive as fast as you want, as slow as you want, but you can't slam on the brakes to cause an accident. You don't spin around and drive the wrong way. You don't drive off the road. You don't bang into another car. Other than that, you obey the rules of the road and you know you've got multiple directions you can go to get to your destination. And they go, oh, okay, got it, man. So that's how we frame it. You know, it's, it's the rules to the game. How do I win? And they respond ridiculously well to that. I love this for many reasons. First, it's exactly how we design programs for entrepreneurs because that's that's the entrepreneur yeah. skills that you need. Navigating uncertainty yeah. means there is nothing else than you navigating. Yeah. And that's right. it. That's the situation. Yeah. And everything is built around that. But also because you have you treat young heroes, as you say, as, as a fractal of the universe, as, as something that is complete and full of knowledge and full of energy. And, and now you just want to be part of this journey and creating the right. and holding the space for them to, That's right. for their path to unfold, which is That's a right. beautiful um, philosophy to have. And if we have more of this in the world, we would have much less division and much more co-creation and collaboration, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, from a, a guiding standpoint and a mentorship standpoint, that's absolutely it. It's much more of the, hey, we are the guide alongside of you. We will, um, you know, continue to point your, you know, lift your eyes to the horizon to just say, hey, there is this option here. There's this option here. Uh, you know, what, what sounds good? These are all great choices. What do, where do you want to go? And how, how if we open a door over here, is that a door you want to walk through, right? It's more of that, that guiding and mentoring kind of, kind of deal. And then even from a conversational standpoint, you know, we're very big on the Socratic conversations and our job as the adults on campus is never to say, look, this is how it is. This is what you believe. This is what we believe. We actually don't even answer questions ever on campus. We don't answer questions. Our questions will come and our, our answers will come back in the form of, of questions, right? And because ultimately what we want to get is young people who are almost immune to that division that you just spoke of. Because I can sit down and listen to Simon and Simon says, look, this is why I believe what I believe. And, and you're able to eloquently speak to what it is. I genuinely listen to that. And if I disagree with some or all, then I say, Simon, that's great. I understand your point. If I you know, understand you correctly, you're saying this. Here's the point that I disagree. Here's the evidence that I feel like I might have. And then at the end of this conversation, we both understand each other's perspectives. Maybe one of us switched. Maybe we didn't. And at the end of it, we go, cool. At least we have an understanding and a respect. I can still shake your hand. We can still be friends and we can move on. Right. I mean, that's ultimately where we want to get everybody to go. Not there's nobody on the planet that agrees with you on 100 percent of the things. My wife doesn't agree with me on 100 percent of everything, but we still make it work. Right. And so that's where we want everybody to get. How can we help you get from three schools to 200 schools? You know, it, this is uh, this has been our, our thing. So we've I've got three personally as a network. Uh, a global network. There are there are just about 200 schools right now. Um, we are wanting to get to a strong thousand, um, you know, and we're and we're spreading the word in kind of the evangelical way. But what's beautiful about this whole thing is, uh, you know, there's a the saying, right? The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Our young heroes uh, are really spreading the word for us by everything that they're doing. They really are, you know, they're the ones that as their life transforms and as they are taking on responsibility, when I tell people that we have, you know, a 17 year old over here who's, who's hasn't graduated just yet from high school, but he's already working a six figure job that was a college graduates only job, right? You have to have a college degree, but somehow he has that job and is making six figures while he's 17. Um, when I tell people I've got a 14 year old here on this campus who has her products in seven different storefronts 
um, you know, out here in this, in this state. And she just sold some of her stuff to Tony Hawk. And she's talking to, you know, when I tell people these stories, when they're sharing these stories, then people go, okay, how is this possible? Right. And that's, that magic is what is, is going to continue to, to, to spread, you know, the beauty of what's going on here. Beautiful. If some mm. entrepreneurs are listening to this and they want to send their school, their kids, yeah. or if they want to become mentors in your ecosystem, yeah. how, can they, how can they reach? How can they contribute? Yeah, the best way to do it is to find out if there is something near you or something that's planning on coming up near you. So if you go to, um, you know, it's actonacademy.org, that's kind of our overarching umbrella. You go to actonacademy.org, uh, there is a search function in there where you can find a location near you and you can see if there is something near you. And we are in uh, multiple countries. I want to say we're in close to 30 countries right now um, in the States. We're in close to 40 states. Um, and people can find out if there is something that is near them and 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 reach those individuals on the ground uh, directly through that. That'd be the best way to go. Love it. And mm -hmm. now... Uh, to people who break the rules, the strategy award yes. question. When everybody's zigging, this person is zagging. But from your perspective, they are doing the right thing. Who do you pick? Yeah, yeah, that's a really that's a tough. I I kind of run in this ecosystem, so I have so many friends that I would say, you know, I, I that I could put for this. But I think in the context of this conversation, um, I would point to a man by the name of Isaac. Morehouse. Uh, Isaac Morehouse uh, doesn't have as much notoriety maybe as, as he should, but he is the uh, founder of an organization called Praxis. So discoverpraxis.com. Um, he is also the founder of a platform called Crash. Uh, and Isaac has made a career out of zigging when everybody else was zagging. And he is challenging some of the biggest social norms when it comes to post high school. And when it comes to uh, getting the job of your dreams, uh, he is, especially for young people, unlocking so many paths that we are told do not actually exist. Um, so in the context of this conversation, I'm going to go with Isaac Morehouse as the founder of Praxis and of Crash. Boom. And and now that you have such a, a noble philosophy behind what you do, and, and this is so relevant because everybody... Yeah. Myself, in my work with, with my own coach, we found times where it says, I'm not worth it. We found these beliefs deep there all the time. I'm not worth yeah. I'm not good enough. I'm not worth mm -hmm. it. And that comes from somewhere. So if, mm -hmm. if you are working on a system that has less of these and ideally even none of these, that's beautiful. And uh, are there any books that you can share from this uh, field? Where, that you can recommend. Yeah, I, I love that you I love that you framed it that way, too, because we do believe that, you know, we look at every one of our young heroes as the next is what we say. And we just say, look, if I knew I was talking to this five year old and they were the next Albert Einstein, they were the next Elon Musk, they were the next Rosa Parks, they were the next fill in the blank with whoever you want, you would treat that human as the genius that they really are. Right. And so anybody that uh, if anybody is interested in the educational philosophy, anything by John Taylor Gatto, one of the things he said was that, you know, genius is as common as dirt. And, and I believe that very much. You just have to figure out what that specific genius is. So, you know, John Taylor Gatto's work will live on in infamy. There's a reason teachers are never exposed to him in their training because it would make you not want to teach. It would make you want to educate. Instead, mm -hmm. it shifts your beliefs. So, um, you know, if you have John Taylor Gatto, uh, I think uh, dumbing us down uh, is a and it's a it's a that's a harsh title, I guess. But dumbing us down um, will help shift uh, the mindset a little bit, kind of release you from the emotional attachment to the religion of school as we know it. Um, so that book there. And then I think after that, kind of a um, almost a linear progression there is Courage to Grow by Laura Sandefer. Mm -hmm. um, that really outlines our belief, our philosophy as, uh, as the global organization that we are and really talks about kind of the, 
um, really the start of this Acton Academy network, you know, as we're growing, Courage to Grow outlines it beautifully. Um, and then moving forward from that, another one that is kind of a, um, kind of speaks to the, what you mentioned of, of people thinking for themselves, I'm not good enough, right? Like not just thinking outside of the school thing from the parental standpoint or from the educator standpoint of working with these young people, as you go into the young people themselves to get cut through the noise and the garbage and the BS that tells people culturally they're not good enough. Uh, there is a book called The Alter Ego Effect uh, by Todd Herman. Mm. And I'm a big fan of that one too. And that can, really is for absolutely anybody. Todd uh, started out as more of a sports psychologist working with professional athletes, but he went into um, actors, high level CEOs, and he helps them um, not always necessarily identify why they feel like they're not good enough. He helps them break out of it by creating these identities for themselves that are good enough and then operating in that identity more often than not. Right. And so that's this kind of psychological game, this mindset switch. Uh, and and the way he does that, I think, is pure brilliance. And I think anybody can benefit from that. So those are a few books for people to check out that I think will shift uh, a lot of things for people. I have heard the uh, alter ego effect as an audiobook. I loved it. I I, Did you? Oh, I stopped cool. running just to re-listening to it. It's beautiful. The stories yeah. of Beyonce and others, how they create their superhero and they their shield. Beautiful. That's correct. Yes, very much so. Yeah, and I've gotten to I've gotten to speak directly with some of his clients in in the business world uh, as well who who have done that. And it's so and, it, and I think it spoke to me so heavily because I um, almost inherently have found myself doing that right a number of times. I mean, I, I truly am probably more introverted than than extroverted, but my passion for education and the way that I present myself as the leader of this organization. Everybody on campus will say, oh, my gosh, you're probably the biggest extrovert here. I go stand on stages and have a thousand people in the audience or two thousand people in the audience. And it's very much a performance. And it is, you know, be, oh, you're ex but it's it's I get into the mind frame of this is the guy that I'm going to be right now. Um, but it's not who I am all the time. It's just a heightened version of a piece of me. You know, and I thought Todd explained it. Uh, phenomenally well in in that book and then gave me some other tools too to kind of work with that. So yeah, very good stuff. That's awesome. Glad, so, you, glad you've heard it. So if we recognize that we are operating in this mode, uh, imposter syndrome, no, can I do that? I don't think I should do that. Yeah. Can, can we shortcut and go directly to the part where we go, okay, What's the role right now? It's CEO. Okay, what would the best CEO do right now? The best version of myself? Let's go there. What's the picture? Yeah. Batman or something else? And okay, what yeah. would Batman do right now? Okay, let me do this. Can we yeah. shortcut it that way? Should we? Can we go the direct path? I, I, can we and should we? I think are both yeses. Do we is is where it's it's a lot further from a yes for most people. And so... You know what that is is that emotional attachment to something else usually it's that emotional attachment to somebody else's expectations right mm -hmm. so that's usually what is getting in the way and it doesn't matter if you're talking about a young hero who is like ah but my friends or ah but my parents because even as adults it is oh but if i parent my own child this way what will my mom think of how i'm parenting if i parent my own child this way what will my next door neighbor think of how I'm parenting, right? What will my body, it's, we still get stuck in that loop uh, as, as adults, uh, very much so. So if we can release that worry about other people's opinions and expectations of us, then yes, I think uh, we can flow in and out of those identities as we need to. And it's not in a psychologically harming way it's actually uh, quite beneficial but it's it's got that it's got that big butt over here of can you get out of other people's expectations yeah i i will apply this directly this week because in many times i see myself on the street 
And when when I like educate or non-educate, when I intervene or not intervene with my two boys, who, and then being watched by other parents, and uh, sometimes yeah. I feel like I don't want them to criticize this. Yeah. What about if I try a different path? I could say, what would now uh, yeah. the best person, the best version of my being parent do? Yeah, and I go directly there, and I care less yep. about anything else. And you, yeah, and you care less about anything, and it's almost can can even go back to what I've done with my own, <clears throat> my own altars, right? For for lack of a better word, so my there is parent Matt, there is husband Matt, there is keynote speaker Matt, there's podcast host Matt, there's school leader Matt, there's the different Matt. When I go to work out, there's a different right. So you have all of these heightened senses of yourself. And what I've tried to do for each one of these is go back to that gamifying sort of situation, right? Who is, so who is this altar? How do you win the game of being this altar? What does that look like? What are the rules to being this person? And I'm creating those rules based off, you know, there was a, uh, there was a great book, Think and Grow Rich, which I'm sure your audience is, you know, it was all heard of, but my favorite part of that whole book was the board of directors conversation, right? Where he goes, okay, what would it, you know, who would my board of directors be for this part of my life? Meaning who are the mentors that I look up to for this part of my life? And so you're creating those altars based on the board of directors. So if I'm creating a workout altar, I go, okay, as a workout, you know, I'm going to get into this mindset. So maybe my board of directors for this altar, I'm going to be a combination of David Goggins because of, you know, his mental strength. I'm going to be a combination. I'm going to be uh, Jocko Willink because of the discipline, you know, to continue to move forward. I'm going to be my friend Tim Kennedy because of, you know, the the heroic nature in which he approaches the workout, whatever that looks like for you. And you develop that game of that altar. And then you're just learning to switch back and forth into those various games. I love this. It, it, yeah. And we could create one for, for every main role, like best CEO, best correct. father, best husband, best athlete when we work out. Correct. Find, yep, find something that is our true nature and amplify that via an alter ego, right? That's it. And that's the key, right? It's not, uh, it's not being, you know, uh, it's not being somebody that you aren't. It is finding somebody you resonate with because it is either an amplified version of something that is already within you or it is in your growth plan for yourself somebody that exemplifies something that you really just wish you had more of in a positive way it is those two things you are combining but most often it is it's an amplification you resonate or you 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 resonate with it for a reason there is a reason you're drawn to that because it's already something that you like like we said at the beginning you are you are complete you are whole and so this is something that resonates because you are wanting to just amplify that part of you that is already there so you're now you're just defining it and you're taking hold of that i love this and so when we resonate when, so when we see somebody and we go yeah. oh this is home this is yeah. this is my people then yes. this is our true nature and it's just an amplified or externalized version right that's right and i think we know those things early on simon i can i can clearly remember uh being 14 years old and i was in a movie theater and that's what's that's what's interesting too is so many of my altars so many of my board of directors um, aren't even necessarily real people <laughs> uh, they were fictional characters in a book or a movie or something you know and that's and I remember being 14, sitting in a movie theater, watching the movie Braveheart. And I watched it and the William Wallace character, which isn't even necessarily historically correct, but it's the William Wallace character in that movie was that was portrayed by Mel Gibson. And just his commitment to fighting for something and believing in it so wholeheartedly and having that mission where he was willing to ultimately even sacrifice his own life for the for his people for this concept there was something that res and i went you know what i i feel like that is i feel like that is me i feel like i'm going to live my life really mission driven i don't know what that is i have no idea what that mission is going to be but i can't help but think that that I'm going to live so strongly to a, 
a virtuous mission and ideal. You know, it resonated, it resonated with me at 14 years of age. Uh, and, and only, you know, recently in the past decade or so did I understand what it was going to be and, and I have been able to amplify it. But I think it is. It's part of our true nature. We just have to pay attention. I love this. And I, I remember it. So I, I am I am good at running and endurance, but I always skip yeah. the heavy lifting, the heavy weight. And so yeah, I yeah, started yeah. CrossFit and I was like, oh, my God, how can I endure this every day? And then I started yeah. thinking, Ben Bergeron is this coach yeah. of the CrossFit people. And yeah. I was like, what would Ben now do? Yes. He would do it. Is it the right plan? He would do it. Is it is it yeah. the right thing to go max yet now? Yes. Yeah. So well, what would he do? He would persist. So let's persist. That's awesome, man. Good for you. That's rad. Yeah, Ben's a uh, Ben's a stud. Um, so many of those guys, from a physical standpoint, mental standpoint, um, they're brilliant. And actually, I'm uh, one of my friends was one of the Jason Kalipa. If you're familiar with, yeah, uh, Jason, right, was the second. I think he was he won the second CrossFit Games. Um, I think in like 2008, something like that. A uh, phenomenal human. We've had him on as a mentor uh, and on the podcast for uh, for the Apogee Strong Boys, and uh, he's helping us plan out some of the uh, physical challenges for these young guys that we are mentoring and stuff too. So yeah, I mean, it's just the mental and the physical connection. I love that you're doing that, man. That's great. So to all entrepreneurs listening, if you are like we are, uh, that you both feel you really resonate with superheroes, but sometimes you feel weak and overwhelmed, etc. Maybe you don't have to do five years of uh, psychotherapy. Maybe right. you, you try the direct path. See who, right. who are these heroes that you resonate with, that your kids resonate with. Let, let them be your teacher in, in how to find mm -hmm. them, in how to resonate with them. And then mm -hmm. just do it. For my kids, it's ninjas. And, uh, and when they see them, they go, I have this power. And then they have this power. There is nothing in between. They go, I have this power. And then they have this power. And then you feel it. <laughs> that's it. They go right to it. We lose that as we get older because we get told that's ridiculous. But that's exactly what young people do. They go, I am this. I am a ninja. My young, my son, who is my, uh, my youngest, he's five. At the dinner table last night, one of our family members literally said something, you know, what, do you, what are the problems you want to you know, change? What do you want to do as you get older? And he's like, I want to be a ninja. He said that exact thing. He says, I want to be a ninja. And they're like, great. Is there ninja school? He goes, I don't know yet. If not, I'll start one, but I want to be a ninja. I, I was like, great, cool. And as soon as he gets into that role, in his mind, he is a ninja. He sees everything as a ninja. He acts as a ninja. He talks as a ninja. He embodies the ninja. And we get that trained out of us a lot of times in school. Uh, and it is a superpower to be able to do that. We got to get back to that. And I love that part. Well, I don't know, but if there isn't one, I will build one. That's the entrepreneurial spirit. Because another okay. way of answering that question would be, oh, no, I don't know. Let me let me find out. Eh, Dad, Dad, is there one? No, he says, well, if there isn't one, I will build. Right. That's right. Because if that's a need, or if it's there, great, I'll take advantage of it. If it's not, then I will figure out how to create it. That's exactly right. That is that entrepreneurial spirit. We build our schools this way precisely for that kind of thinking. Right? And people say, well, gosh, you just want everybody to be an entrepreneur. Absolutely not. I don't need everybody to be an entrepreneur, but I think that entrepreneurial spirit is invaluable. The, the will to say, look, if this is not, if this is currently available and it's useful, great, then I will use it. If it is not available, why not? And how can I make it available? How can we bring this here? There's no downside to thinking that way. And we and need that this skill because in my generation, okay, there are four types of work. Pick one, do it your whole life. But it's changed, yeah. right? There is no category where you can pick that and then you do that for your whole life. It's, yeah. it's much more complicated right now than you need to carve your niche, sometimes carve, create your business. That's right. Sometimes you need to create it. And then again, that adaptability as things continue to change, we've, you've got to be able to change with it. We've got to be able to change with it. You know, that's one thing I tell our parents is every year is going to look slightly different here on campus because the games will need to change. Um, you know, the, the world will move in various directions and we need to, unlike school that is very uh, top heavy, there's a lot of 
you know, a, a hierarchy. There's a lot of moving parts. You've got to get permission to get permission to get permission to get permission. And then you're probably going to get told no, right? And like, no, we need to, we continuously move depending on what the world is doing. So every year will look slightly different. Uh, and that's again, kind of that entrepreneurial spirit of just like, cool, as, as things are going, I'm going to figure out, uh, how to operate within that and, and to create the best possible scenario within that. So let me remind the listeners, if, if you were just listening and you couldn't note down, let me remind you the three book tips, dumping us down, courage to grow and the alter ego effect. Mm -hmm. And um, Matt, uh, where can people get a hold of you? Where, where do you hang out? So I'm, I'm, often on the naughty list as far as instagram is concerned um i am currently on the naughty list uh shadow ban you know so they say so some people will be able to find me there some people won't but that is one of the places that i am definitely most active uh, is on instagram just under my name at matt bodro um the essential 11 podcast uh, i would love for people to just check that out go through find your favorite entrepreneur that i've got an interview and just give that a listen um, and then apogeestrong.com, actinplasser.com, both great uh, places to find out what we're doing with, with young heroes. I found you on Instagram. Good. That's great. Well, hopefully the, the naughty list will get, uh, will get alleviated because def I am definitely uh, feeling it right now. We did a, um, I did an interview for a magazine last week and they're trying to post things. They're like, we can't tag you in anything. It won't let us tag you in anything. And you know, current stories that are usually, you know, and I'm not in it for views or likes or anything like that, but you just see the, you know, if a story is normally getting a thousand views, you know, by the end of the day, right now it's getting like 50, 60. Uh, so uh, it's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll come back off the naughty list at some point. I'm sure I'll do something that'll get me put back on, but uh, I stay active there for now. That's that's why we need the skills that your schools are built upon and are teaching because we need to adapt all the time. It never stops. That never stops. You are correct, sir. And who should be my next guest? That's another great. That's another great one because there are so many people um, that I, that I feel like we could we could name. I mean, it's an it literally is an infinite list. Um, but I like to highlight some people that. Um, are maybe doing some massive things and not, and they're not necessarily household names. Um, I have got a good friend by the name of Michael Brooks, uh, and Michael is the uh, founder and CEO of GoLance. Uh, GoLance is very much like a Fiverr or something like for for freelance operators. Which again, moving into this world of kind of the gig economy, where people are able to build out these careers from just piecing you know, bits of work here and there from, from people all over the world. And, you know, Michael has developed this platform on GoLance that very quickly uh, is now operating at, a, at, at close to a hundred million dollars a year. And he's really the only one operating it. Um, and he's this phenomenal human being, a brilliant guy, should be a household name. Um, uh, and is, you know, starting more and more to be so. But Michael Brooks would be my pick for that. He's a fascinating human, brilliant and hilarious. I'm, I'm so inspired by this. Thank you, Matt, so much for being here and for doing Ab what you do. Absolute pleasure, my friend. And uh, I hope this message gets across over many, many countries and people can contribute to this beautiful mission. And see you soon, my friend. Yes, sir. Thank you. Avoid trying to do thousands of things that doesn't work. We have 274 templates for your business success. Reach your ambitious goals with one-on-one -on -one sprint coach. We double your revenue in 90 days.